Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Srinivas, and I have Vivek with me here. Uh, we're from Symantec. Uh, so today, uh, we just wanted to share our experiences with um, real-time and batch processing um, across a wide variety of workloads, um, both on-prem and uh, talk a little bit about our journey uh, towards the public cloud. And uh, with that, so here's a high-level agenda. Um, Brief introduction, uh, Symantec, so we're one of the leading providers of software, security software, uh, for both um, enterprises and um, uh, customers. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, most of you are probably familiar with Norton and its family of products, but there's actually uh, many more products in the enterprise segment where we cater to the Fortune 500 and 1,000, uh, where we protect their email to, you know, the networks and, you know, everything. So. What that means is there's a lot of um, endpoints that are deployed in, in, uh, in real world that are actually sending us telemetry data like every second, every millisecond that we collect, we analyze, and we, and we uh, provide that intelligence back to our products, basically. Um, so that's how um, you know, we uh, protect our, our customers. And you can see that, you know, the various things that we do. So these five themes are pretty central to what Symantec does in every product is uh, thought through along these lines. Um, high level again, you know, our challenge is we need to protect the customer. You, you guys are probably aware of like zero day attacks, like zero day attacks are, uh, you know, happening. I'll talk a little bit about WannaCry, which, you know, recently happened, you know, last month, and what Symantec did and how data played a crucial role in actually figuring that out. Um, and then, you know, we fight the adversary, but we need to be careful. You know, there's PII data, there's, you know, um, sensitive information, so how do we deal with that? Um, along with, you know, we push code, you know, pretty much every day, and how do we make sure that we don't jeopardize any of our customers' uh, security? Uh, so let me briefly talk um, a little bit about data use cases at Symantec. I guess most of you, when you look at Symantec, you guys think about, okay, it's antivirus or like protection and things like that. That is, while that is true, but what actually powers that? A lot of it that powers that is actually the data, the data that we collect. And that's what I want to like highlight as to some of these use cases, there's tons of use cases, there's a lot of uh, products that Symantec has built over the years that are actually data products. If you really look at it, at the end of the day, you know, how do you know, uh, uh, how can you classify that a particular file is malicious or not? How do you do that, right? Um, it is all about the data. You know, we need to know something about um, the, uh, the signature of the file or, you know, some associations with other files, machines. There's a lot of uh, entities as part of this that we collect, and then we make a determination if, if, if whether a file is malicious. The same thing applies to URLs, like is a particular URL safe or not. Um, and if you deploy one of our semantic products, you get all of this intelligence, um, uh, which tells you, hey, don't download this, or you know, this is a mal or this is a malicious uh, website, or things like that. Um, and a lot of our systems um, are built around. Uh, certain entities like files, URLs, IPs, uh, machines. And we build out like a large graph, an edge map basically. And we figure out associations between them and then we do like machine learning and deep learning on top of that. That actually goes and it, it's fed back into our products uh, which actually helps protect our customers basically. Um, so a lot of these applications, I mean these are just like very, you know, I just picked a three uh, use cases that we have, but these are these are big data applications in their own right. So if you look at the first application, where I say it's a file, we call it a file file intel application, and there's a lot of infrastructure that actually backs up that, like you know Kafka, Storm, HBase, where we do a lot of crunching and machine learning and 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 provide that intelligence back to the products. Um, like I was saying earlier, I mean most of you you know, are familiar with what happened in, I think, mid-May or early May. Uh, one of the things is, um, you know, I and my team, like, we can relate directly to what happens out there of the, due to the work that we do. So a lot of the stuff that you see in the press saying that, hey, WannaCry was because of this or that, 
that intelligence is actually literally coming up from the data platforms that, that we build, which means that we have teams of, uh, we call AIT, uh, these are intelligence specialists. Their job is like when there's a threat, they actually have tools, big data tools basically, that they leverage uh, to literally query the data in this case and figure out the associations and then, and then talk to the press or you know, publish their findings basically. Um, so, so this is uh, you know, pretty tangible in terms of the impact that uh, data, may, uh, data provides at uh, Symantec. Again, uh, you know, reinforcing or buttressing my earlier point, um, you know, our security literally runs on big data. Uh, in the past, so we still do have some legacy um, infrastructure that we have in place, like Vertica. You know, we have Green Plum in some cases that uh, actually power uh, some of these applications. Uh, but uh, a lot, of, but like I said, I'll go into a bit more detail. Um, we are moving, or we're moving to the cloud. We have moved to the cloud. There's a lot of this infrastructure that I'll go into a bit more detail as to like how we crunch uh, data and some of the architectures that actually power this stuff. Uh, high level, this is, this is what the team does. You know, uh, one of the things is Symantec being, you know, we've been in the industry for almost like more than 40 years, or close to 35 years. So there's a lot of products. There's a lot of legacy products, right? And the challenge actually is, you know, how do you get all of that telemetry data into one place. Just getting it to one place is actually a gargantuan task. Um, so why do we need that? I'll talk about it. I mean, it's the concept around the data lake, uh, because shared intelligence between products, you know, having the source of truth, and all the good things that we all know about. Uh, second, uh, what's our mission? You know, at a high level, that's what our mission is. Uh, we've made a big bet last year to move uh, a lot of the analytics workloads over into the cloud, or into the public cloud. Um, so, so you'll see uh, Vivek cover uh, a few things around what we've learned about uh, things in the cloud. Um, you know, you, you know, you usually, you know, hear the term lift and shift. Like, you know, how do you not get into that uh, situation? Like, what are some of the things that you need to think through, and whatnot? So, here are some of the numbers that uh, that my team manages right now. Uh, this is purely uh, Hadoop and its ecosystem. Uh, so uh, I'll go into a bit more detail. Uh, we have, uh, you know, like I said, 14 like managed deployments. Like again, Semantic is a large company where uh, there's different products and different use cases. So you just can't have like a one size fits all where you just deploy one cluster and you know and you're done. Uh, some of these uh, we actually uh, have. A variety of workloads. We have streaming workloads. We have batch workloads. Uh, we have mini batch, like you know, latency. Uh, you know, varies from application to application. Certain applications have to be under a minute or, or a few or a few seconds. Uh, some applications have a higher tolerance uh, limit uh, when it comes to latency. They can be like once a day. Um, so we have you know all of that. And uh, our customers. So we have about like 500 internal users. These are. Our internal users are, uh, these are not your typical like BI uh, users, these are more of like researchers. So we have dedicated uh, teams of like, you know, data scientists, uh, we have uh, machine learning teams, um, you know, threat responders uh, that actually use these systems day in and day out. And then, uh, you know, we have millions of end users as well, right? Because the data that we provide is actually fed back to our products, which, I, which is actually deployed in uh, our customers' premises, basically. Uh, so that's how we serve our customers, and we have around like 4,000 live batch and streaming jobs on any given day, and it's actually growing, um, you know, at a pretty uh, fast clip. Um, High-level overview. Um, you know, what we've done over the last uh, two years is, like I said, we have a lot of products. And some of these products are very old, some of them are new, uh, some of them are acquisitions that Symantec has made. So the challenge actually is, how do you actually standardize the ingestion methodology um, to, to provide, you know, data that is of high quality and available and, you know, the whole, you know, nine years that we all know about. And, um, 
another important aspect when it comes to security, which is actually no different from, you know, if you're at, you know, a web company or any other company, you want a 360 degree view of anything, right? Like you, you hear a lot about like 360 degree view of a customer. In our case, like we want to get a, a global view of the threat landscape, for example. So how do you do that? So for, for us to kind of, you know, get there, you need to have everything in one place. You need to be able to correlate events across products and across customers. Um, and then, um, you know, we currently ingest around uh, 15 terabytes of data, you know, per, uh, terabytes of data per day compressed. This is a high level of the stack that, 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 that we use. Um, uh, we do. Yeah, so I should, yeah, so this throughput is actually specific to our Kafka throughput. Um, so that's how many uh, million messages we, uh, events per second, basically. That's what, and Vivek is gonna go into a bit more detail about like Kafka, the tuning, and all of those things that we've done to kind of get there. And so this is sort of like a high level uh, overview of most of the data platforms that we have deployed at Symantec. Um, while we do have some legacy uh, systems that are on-prem, um, you know, uh, this represents mostly what we have on, uh, on Amazon. And, uh, you know, we uh, leverage S3 pretty heavily. Uh, that's our object store, our single source of truth for all security telemetry data. And then uh, we do have some data tiering that we do across HDFS, S3, and Glacier, which again, Vivek is gonna go into a bit more detail for you know, primarily like cost reasons as well. Um, and then um, data storage, like so we use, uh, Kafka is pretty much central to our data lake. Um, and um, we do have you know, certain use cases for HBase where applications that I talked about, like applications or products that would want to store some state um, you know, and, uh, you know, we use HBase in those cases and, you know, you know Hadoop, HDFS. Um, and then on top of that, so we have, uh, you know, a wide variety of workloads. So we use uh, Storm and Trident for, um, you know, real-time streaming and mini micro-batching. Um, Spark, a lot of our product teams or applications that are built on top of the data lake actually use Spark to build their applications. So we support Spark and Hive and MapReduce. And we use Uzi to kind of do the orchestration of the data pipeline end to end, and Ranger sets our policy, security policies. Uh, and on top, uh, we have these gateway services. Some of these are homegrown, some of them are open source. Um, so we don't provide like direct Hive shell access to our end users, so we have one of these services where users can um, you know, leverage to you know, fire off their queries or you know, whatever it is that they wanna do. And then uh, we use a combination of Ambari, Cloudbreak, and Ansible for deploying, and, um, uh, and uh, we use a combination of actually homegrown tools uh, to do the monitoring and alerting. Um, so we use Ambari, but uh, LMM is something you know, that we've developed internally that alone actually deserves its own talk. It's a real-time telemetry, uh, not telemetrics, uh, collection and aggregator. Um, so Vivek is gonna touch again a little bit on that, uh, but we use uh, LMM pretty heavily to monitor our infrastructure across, um, across the stack. Uh, so this is a typical deployment that we have on Amazon. Um, so, so we started off with you know, uh, one particular region, so all of our stuff is on the east, this east uh, region, and um, some of the things to consider is with the cloud, um, you, know, uh, you know, it's pretty, uh, you know, easy and relatively straightforward to do a, a high available deployment. So all of the masters across like Kafka uh, or your, you know, HBase and Storm supervises, all of these are, are uh, you know, across multiple uh, zones. Uh, so that you know you get um, uh, high availability, and then we have ELB uh, deployed so that you know you, it's transparent to end users, you know, accessing any of these services. Um, and uh, we don't have uh, a multi-region uh, at this point, but uh, that's something in our roadmap for uh, before the end of this year to deploy, uh, 
you know, a, a different a stand up the same infrastructure in a different region. So there's discussions around like, do we need active, 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 passive? At, at the end of the day, it becomes, it boils down to a, a cost uh, question. So uh, now I'm gonna delve a little bit deep into the ingestion architecture, right? Um, so on the top, so this is how, uh, so endpoints are pretty much like, you know, if you have the software semantic, a particular semantic product deployed, you know, let's say that we call that an endpoint. And these endpoints, um, you know, send data to our telemetry gateways. And again, a lot of this is abstracted and, you know, for, for the sake of simplicity here, uh, there's a lot of complexity behind that, but, you know, endpoints ship data to a telemetry gateway. And then um, all of this, actually, this infrastructure up until the Kafka bridge is actually hosted on Azure. Uh, don't ask me why, it's, it's a different team doing it, so Symantec is like a big company and people have choices to you know, deploy wherever they want to. So all of this is actually on Azure, and, um, uh, and uh, you can see that all of these products you know, submit their submissions to, to, to the gateways, and, and there's a lot of processing that happens here um, inside uh, before it gets to the RabbitMQ. Uh, which is basically converting it into Avro. There's some basic data quality checks that they do. You know, there's you know a few things that happen. And finally, what happens is um, it come, it lands, or it is published into uh, a central Kafka cluster that we manage, which is actually on Amazon. Um, that's where, like, technically the data lake starts. You can imagine it that way. And then. Um, we use uh, uh, Trident uh, to consume the data from Kafka. Um, we, you know, deserialize the data. So a lot of this data, the telemetry data, is tightly packed. Um, you know, we uh, so we use average serialization, but in some cases, again, this is actually uh, the legacy reasons we have, like protobufs, for example. So you have an Avro message, and inside of it, you know, you have like protobufs. So a lot of the stuff that happens in, inside of Trident is like unpacking that, um, and um, and then once it's deserialized, there's a series of transformations that actually happen. You know, it's filtering, uh, lookups, for example. So uh, we get a good for a customer, but we we do have a lookup from our EDW system where we get the customer ID, for example. And um, these are interesting problems. Uh, I'd love to you know, kind of get you guys' feedback later on on how you guys do it. One of the things is we use um, you know, an open source technology called Chronicle Maps for our in-memory real-time uh, lookups, basically. Uh, and um, uh, while it works, but there are certain challenges that, that you're, we're trying to overcome at this particular point. And then, after a lot of these transformation functions, we finally push the data back to another topic within Kafka so that now, uh, you know, if there's other use cases, real time, or, you know, other applications that want to consume this data, they're free to consume the data. Um, after that, you know, we again read the data from Kafka and we publish it to HDFS. So, the reason for publishing the data to HDFS is that you know, we, know, we do know that HDFS is faster than S3. So one of the things is uh, most of our applications uh, need last seven days of data. So we store last seven days of data in um, HDFS, in org files. Uh, and then we, so that's what this, this particular um, box highlights here. Um, and anything beyond seven days, is moved uh, to S3. So, so this is this is a high level of the ingestion. There's a lot of details that I'm just like skimming through here, but um, yeah. All right, I'll hand it over to Vivek, who's going to cover uh, things about like how we deploy things, and more importantly, like the lessons that we've learned uh, through our journey. Uh, we just publish it to a different topic. Uh, could you say that again?
Uh, it is actually, I mean, it is the same. So are you saying that the, there are two Kafka instances there? Yeah, yeah, so the second Kafka instance It's the same Kafka. It's the same, in, it's the same cluster. Right, why should you why put it back on the Kafka? Oh, why, oh, because uh, let's say there's a real-time use case, right? There's an application that wants to consume the data right then and there. Uh, we, and actually, we do have an application called DeepSight, which is, um, which is deployed where, like, Symantec has a product called uh, Managed Security Services, where we ingest all of our customers' data. The customers' data actually flows into our data center, and uh, there's a whole application that is actually built on top of that to analyze threats in real time. So that's why we put data back into Kafka. And I think in general, like having, uh, like, you know, having Kafka, your central hub, actually serves well because now you're getting out of the way from your applications because let's say you, know, you have a sub-second latency and I have a latency of an hour, right? I could still go to Kafka and, and consume it. I'm not like, you know, I don't have to do anything special for you. So it really uh, allows uh, you know, data to be, you know, in a way like democratize it. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. So, well, again, uh, these are big company problems, I guess, but uh, that's a whole another team that actually does that, uh, that actually is responsible for the telemetric collection, right? And that's actually hosted in Azure, like I said. Uh, there's really, I mean, you could use Kafka for that, right? But having said that, RabbitMQ gives you know certain advantages over Kafka, but then again, that's a whole another topic, like why Rabbit versus Kafka. So. So uh, just to continue what Srinivas said, uh, one another reason for having RabbitMQ is that the RabbitMQ is also, uh, so the telemetry gateway that we have are regional telemetry gateways. They are not like, they are, they are in each of the different regions that we have uh, where we collect the data directly from the endpoints. They just go to RabbitMQ in that region and then they go to the central, central clock Kafka. So that's also one of the reasons why we have RabbitMQ just to collect data for one region. Uh, <coughs> And uh, moving on uh, to uh, some of the things uh, which are more uh, more towards the ground right now. Uh, so uh, how we deploy the entire platform. So when we started doing this uh, platform, we initially built it all on bare metal. Uh, that was about uh, one and a half years back. And then uh, Semantic as a company decided to move to public cloud. And when we moved to public cloud, uh, there are a lot of issues uh, around managing and deploying this bigger platform, uh, comparatively big, uh, not as big as uh, some of the bigger companies, but uh, we, do have, uh, we do have scale uh, issues around uh, handling about uh, 40 odd Kafka brokers, uh, 40 to 50 odd storm supervisors, uh, uh, and maybe an equal number of node managers plus few other services. So uh, <clears throat> what we found and uh, what we are leveraging is mostly uh, CloudBreak. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if uh, any of you guys have used it, but uh, uh, it, it actually helps us to simplify the provisioning of uh, the HTTP stack on AWS. Uh, we have done a few contributions back to CloudBreak. Uh, I did a talk last startup summit on it, so there is a whole lot of details around that uh, in that talk. Uh, but it mostly allows you to deploy uh, HTTP on AWS and uh, make sure uh, you can use some of the good things about cloud like auto scaling, elasticity, and things like that. Uh, we have written some automation around uh, uh, on top of CloudBreak to uh, recover uh, failures. Uh, uh, we see uh, roughly around <coughs> uh, 0.5 to 0.7 percent nodes going down each day on AWS at times. So, uh, Replacing failed node is a big concern. Uh, we have uh, automation around what do you do when you have a Kafka broker going down, for example. How do you reclaim all the partitions uh, from the EBS volumes and attach it back to the new instance that you just spun up? Uh, <clears throat> uh, 
We also have some automation that I'll talk about uh, on how we leverage uh, the multi-AZ deployment that we have. Uh, so uh, we saw in one of the slides earlier uh, that we are deployed across two AZs, uh, but a uh, lot of these services uh, do not uh, understand this natively, so we have written some tooling around making sure we exploit all the multi-AZ uh, uh, features and uh, uh, make use of them. <coughs> But before we go there, uh, I'll just briefly touch upon uh, the Elk stack that we have uh, for uh, logging and metrics collection. Uh, this we primarily developed just to collect uh, all the logs and metrics that we would emit from our services and applications, but figure out that there is a broader use case wherein uh, other products can use it. So we are now, uh, we are now exposing it out as a service uh, for all the semantic products to use it. It's basically a regular Elk stack wherein you would have uh, Logstash agents uh, uh, sending on uh, your uh, clients, which needs to emit the logs and metrics, sending out all the uh, metrics and logs to uh, Kafka. And then we have uh, a bunch of storm topologies, uh, basically a couple of storm topologies, a metric topology and a log topology. So logs go to Elasticsearch and metrics uh, go to InfluxDB and Elasticsearch booth. Uh, and then we use uh, Kibana, Grafana, and the alerting service around it to uh, get all the alerts. So a lot of details around it. Uh, we may not be able to cover all of it here, but uh, we use it primarily to uh, build graphs like this for our platform. Uh, basically, collect all the JVX metrics and throw it out to our uh, uh, LMM uh, platform, and then alerts, uh, put some alerts on top of it, uh, monitor all the consumer lags. For example, uh, when we have our ingestion pipeline, uh, uh, slowing down because of increased pressure, uh, this guy would typically uh, send out an alert. So the WannaCry uh, incident that Srinivas talked about uh, would, have, would have typically triggered, uh, triggered an alert saying that uh, the ingestion topology is not able to keep up with the increased load because we saw roughly around 1.5 times the regular traffic. And that is where we can leverage all these alerts to maybe uh, deploy uh, another uh, parallel ingestion topology, scale up our Kafka topic, and things like that. <coughs> uh, so apart from this, uh, we have our uh, homegrown uh, platform validation framework. Uh, we call it as Query X. Uh, it's basically typically used to send out small uh, pings and small jobs to all the HTTP services. So this is from the time when uh, uh, Ambari and Ambari metrics were not uh, not uh, did not had all the cool features that they have right now. Uh, uh, so uh, we are essentially converting a lot of these into custom Ambari metrics now. But uh, this essentially helps us to make sure that our all our services are available 24 by 7, uh, and uh, gives uh, gives us a user view of the services. Uh, it will probably tell us how a developer would. Uh, what would be the developer experience uh, when, when the developer is submitting a storm topology, for example, to the storm cluster that we have, and things like that. Uh, again, all of the details that we collect from QueryX goes to the uh, logging, metering, and monitoring stack that we saw, and uh, alerts are generated out of it. Uh, it integrates with uh, PagerDuty and all those uh, stuff uh, uh, to wake us up uh, at 3 a.m. in the morning uh, when things go wrong. Uh, so. That's what it is. Uh, so this, uh, I'll spend last few minutes on uh, some of the <coughs> lessons that we learned while moving from bare metal to the cloud, uh, basically. Uh, so we had a quite uh, quite significant deployment on bare metal when we were moving to cloud. And uh, when we were moving to cloud, uh, our primary goal was to make sure we effectively use our, all the cloud services. So, so uh, for example, we had this petabyte uh, scale HDFS cluster uh, on bare metal, moving, uh, lifting and shifting it as is to cloud was turning out to be expensive. So we decided we would do data tiering. I'll talk about it in a bit. Uh, so then uh, uh, when you move to cloud and when you do data, data tiering, it essentially means your uh, data is in object store and not in HDFS. So it's kind of an anti-pattern uh, in Hadoop world where you're separating out storage and compute. Uh, so you need to do a lot of benchmarking around how your queries would perform. Uh, I have a slide on uh, the benchmarking that we did. 
Uh, resiliency is something that I briefly talked about, uh, where we have seen uh, AWS node failures. Uh, how do we do that? How do we handle those? How do we make sure our ingestion pipelines and applications uh, are not affected by such failures? Uh, how do we automatically spin up uh, a new node without any human intervention, make sure all our Kafka topics are always available, and replicas are in sync? Uh, a lot of the benchmarking we did was around choosing optimal flavors for a lot of the services. Uh, uh, when we moved from bare metal to cloud, uh, what kind of flavors we should be using for Kafka, for example, uh, for Storm, which is compute heavy and things like that. And uh, the performance tuning that we did uh, for uh, uh, getting our ingestion pipeline to scale up to 2.5 million events per second. Uh, we also effectively uh, use uh, uh, auto-scaling feature of AWS uh, by making sure we have designed alerts and policies which would, uh, which would trigger auto-scaling based on uh, utilization. So for example, uh, we typically keep our storm cluster 80% full. So at any point of time uh, when a cluster is 80% full and if someone submits a new topology, more slots are occupied, it will automatically spin up a new supervisor, add it to the cluster and things like that. So same with Kafka when someone creates a new topic. Uh, so. Uh, we are working on uh, scaling down. We do have some scaling down, but that's something that we would aggressively want to do to make sure we spend less money and give less money to AWS, basically. Uh, so data tiering, uh, which I just talked about sometime uh, in the previous slide, uh, what we do to make sure that we are cost efficient is uh, uh, keep our STFS to bare minimum. We are trying to see if we can completely get rid of STFS and just have S3 and have Hive tables point to S3 and let all our uh, real-time applications or applications which needs near real-time or incremental data read off Kafka. And that's where, uh, why we need uh, basically Kafka there. Uh, so uh, seven days of uh, data right now is in hot, what we call as hot tier, which is STFS. Uh, all uh, the data goes to S3, uh, which holds, which is the object store holding three years worth of data. And we have policies on it uh, to move that to Glacier uh, uh, which holds five years worth of data. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> some of uh, the tools that we created around Kafka uh, specifically was uh, to, uh, to disable topic creation using Kafka command line and to create our own topic creation tool. Why we did this specifically is because we wanted to make sure that, uh, like I said, we leverage the easy feature. This was in Kafka 0 0.9, by the way. Uh, so uh, what our topic creation tools does is uh, uh, we have two replicas uh, because we use EBS. We don't need three replicas, uh, uh, or we are saving costs there. Uh, so we made this topic creation tool would make sure that both your replicas are in two different availability zones. Uh, if we use Kafka's topic creation tool, it, there is no guarantee that it will land up on brokers, which are in two different AZs. But our tool makes sure that they go to two different AZs. Also, uh, Kafka, when you create a topic and when with certain number of partitions, what it would do is it would just pick the first replica and make that as a leader. This would mean that our leaders can be across two different AZs. We want AZ to be our, uh, uh, we want to use AZ to fail over in case of a disaster scenario where an availability zone goes down, but we don't want our leaders to be distributed across two different AZs, primarily because if you have a storm topology running in one AZ getting a reading from a Kafka partition, which is in another AZ, we incur data transfer cost. So we make sure that our leaders are in one AZ, but our replicas are distributed across multiple AZs. Uh, so these are some of the things that we do there. Uh, we also make sure we divide our Kafka cluster into a high throughput topic versus low throughput topic. Uh, so uh, when we mark a topic as a high throughput topic when we are creating using this tool, it will make sure that the partitions get their own volumes. Uh, in case of low throughput topics, we are okay sharing a volume with uh, uh, three partitions, so uh, we do that. <coughs> I guess I covered uh, all the four topics uh, that I had on this slide, uh, and uh, we are running short on time as well, so. <coughs> uh, some of the other lessons that we learned was uh, do not jump to the newer version as soon as they are available. Uh, we tried uh, using latest versions. Uh, Storm 1.0 is great. Uh, we love it uh, because of the performance improvements. Uh, Kafka 0 0.10 um, because of the, all the cool uh, time-based querying and SSL ACLs and things like that. Uh, but 
we found issues when we started using the storm graph coverage that comes with uh, HTTP 2.5. <coughs> uh, we opened a case, uh, we have a link there. Uh, we have a resolution now, but uh, we have not tested that yet, uh, so we have not deployed it. But <coughs> uh, that's one of the primary uh, lessons we learned. We are right now on HTTP 2.4, uh, 2.4.3. Uh, what uh, some of the parameters we tuned for Kafka uh, and for Storm uh, or Trident basically and the instance types that we use uh, for Kafka. Uh, I'll just uh, br briefly uh, go through this. I have a few more benchmarking slides. Uh, and then some of the producer and consumer tests that we ran for Kafka. Uh, this is primarily because we wanted to make sure that uh, we compare it with what we were getting in bare metal. Uh, so we figured out that <coughs> we figured out how, how we would we would need to allocate volumes to partitions based on these tests, uh, where we found that uh, you know having a partition per volume on any, on a particular AWS flavor, flavor works well compared to bare metal, for example. Uh, what should be the average uh, size, uh, fetch size, and things like that? Uh, we used uh, these tests to uh, to get all those data. Uh, we did. Uh, so our storm topology is typically uh, write to HDFS, uh, writes to Elasticsearch, and in some cases to HBase. So uh, we, we did tests around that to find out uh, what are the events per second that we can write from bare metal versus uh, different flavors of AWS. And finally, we found that R3 ATX, for example, works best for us. Uh, it gives us comparable performance. We may have want to have uh, where, we, where we're using, for example, one supervisor, we would have had to use two supervisors uh, uh, in storm. Uh, helped helped us estimate uh, how many uh, how many supervisors we would need, how many brokers we would need for a particular EC2 flavor. Uh, <clears throat> and then we did some standard platform tests on HDFS, TerraSort, Benchmark, uh, and all those. Uh, uh, again, uh, we did this across various different types of queries. Uh, since we have multiple different uh, uses of the data that we have on our platform, we have researchers uh, firing certain types of queries. We have batch applications which fire certain other types of queries. Uh, figure out uh, which uh, uh, which queries would work uh, best and uh, things like that. So uh, I have a few minutes left, three minutes left to be more specific. Uh, so I'll just go through this quickly. The same TPCDS benchmark we ran on bare metal and AWS. Uh, interesting test that we ran was uh, Storm versus Trident. Uh, we were uh, debating what to use. Uh, right now we are on Trident, but we may go back to Storm. Uh, there is a lot of uh, difference that we found for our use case. This may not be true everywhere. Uh, um, in fact, uh, there are references uh, over the internet where uh, Trident is claimed to be as good as Storm. Uh, but uh, we found it otherwise. Uh, uh, some of the parameters were possibly uh, required more tuning, but, uh, uh, but it comes with some cost. So, so this is a test which we did primarily to figure out what should be our uh, pipelining in case of Trident, uh, how many batches we can have in pipeline to give get optimum performance. Uh, and how do we make sure that we effectively use Trident, make it keep the CPUs and the resources busy? Uh, the final uh, CPU, this is possibly my last slide. Uh, so uh, CPU utilization test uh, also uh, says that uh, Storm does more better use of CPUs than Trident does. Uh, uh, so these are some of the tests that we did. Uh, I think that's about it. I have, uh, what are we doing next? Uh, is uh, uh, we are uh, trying to see if we can go to a smarter deployment automation, meaning where uh, if there is a way where we can uh, deploy a job and then uh, spin up resources only during job execution and then spin it back down because we are on public cloud, we can do that. Uh, we, uh, like Srinivas said, we are working on our DR strategy. Uh, we would most likely not go with active active because of the cost, cost implications. Uh, active warm standby is something that uh, we are uh, we are leaning towards. Uh, handling surge in traffic efficiently. Uh, this is the lesson that we learned during the WannaCry thing, uh, but that's. Uh, uh, the logs that I show about monitoring uh, monitoring the consumer lag, we would uh, dynamically create a new parallel topic to which we'll spin out, uh, we'll spit out all our uh, overflow events and then have uh, a parallel ingestion topology reading that is the way we would handle it. 
and uh, there are a bunch of micro there are a bunch of monolithic services right now which we would be converting into microservices and uh, right now we do not have kerberos so we are working on it maybe in next uh, next quarter maybe we should be on kerberos so uh, that's about it uh, i think we have very little time for q and a but yeah i'm here yep uh, uh, i was at your your session a year ago oh cloud Keep a look at your AWS build. So <laughs> it's very easy to it's very easy to uh, it's very easy to you know lift and shift what you have in bare metal uh, to uh, AWS. But uh, over a few months, uh, we realized that uh, <clears throat> we are not making efficient use of all the resources. Uh, we are not leveraging uh, CPU and memory like we would have wanted to. Uh, we are making uh, Amazon rich, but it's not helping us. Uh, so that's when we did a lot of the benchmarkings that I showed here, uh, figure out uh, what's the best flavor, uh, uh, how we can how we can uh, make effective use of some of the things like S3 and uh, uh, make Hive tables on top of S3 and things like that. So, yep. So. Yeah, so. Uh, Cloudbreak itself is an automation tool, but we have written a lot of automation around Cloudbreak. We have uh, we have written uh, uh, one-click scripts which would just call Cloudbreak APIs uh, to auto uh, auto scale uh, when we leverage uh, when we leverage uh, when we use the uh, alert on our uh, logging, metering, and monitoring, for example. Rest-based APIs. Easy. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, there is a performance issue. Uh, you would see reduced performance, but uh, uh, it, it's a trade-off, right? All of these are mostly trade-off, whether you want to be HA or whether you want performance. So uh, our, uh, our requirement, since we are not in multiple regions, we should at least be in multiple AZ until we go to multiple regions. So. Uh, we have not yet been using placement groups, but I think it would be much more efficient to use placement groups for sure with respect to performance wise and things like that all right yeah you had a question sir So yeah, I think I would recommend you to go at the talk that I had last year. Uh, we, st we were at the same stage when we evaluated Cloudbreak, uh, but we worked with uh, Hortonworks Cloudbreak team. We contributed back some of the features. Right now, Cloudbreak can do non-Dockerized HTTP. It can do custom AMIs. It can do subnet uh, selections and things like that. So it works pretty well right now. There are a lot of uh, all of these uh, things which were not there before uh, seems to be there now. So our EBS, our HDFS is still instance-based. Where we are using EBS is uh, Kafka mainly. Uh, and uh, our HDFS is tiny, seven days worth of data, so we don't have a scale problem there. Most of our data is in S3. Uh, but Kafka obviously has its own uh, problems with scaling down. You can scale up a topic with partitions, but you cannot scale down. That's where we dynamically create a new topic for our overflow. Uh, events and then destroy that topic too. Sure. Not yet. So that is something that we are trying to uh, evaluate now. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We need to move on. Sure.